And shall you take up and continue the description which the emperor was giving of his furniture in a conversation just related? At one end of the room to the right was a small camp bed of iron, quite plain, with four silver eagles and silk curtains. Two small windows, both without any ornament, gave light to the apartment. Between them stood a scrutoire, upon which was a large dressing case, and before it was an armchair in which Napoleon sat when he was studiously engaged, and when he came out of the bath, a second chair was placed to the left of it, and on the right was the sword which the emperor wore at Austerlitz. The door leading into the bathroom was concealed by an old screen, next to which was an equally old sofa covered with calico. Upon that sofa it was that Napoleon usually reclined and sought shelter from dampness and gnats. His legs thrust into a sack of flannel and a shabby table by the side of him on which were his books or his breakfast. The second room was quite as good as the first. Like it, it was built of mud. Its size was seven feet in height, 15 in length, and 12 in breadth. It had one window and opened into the garden and into the dining room. Its furniture consisted of a camp bed, several guns, two Chinese screens, a chest of drawers, two small tables, on one of which were books and the other bottles, a chair and a magnificent washstand brought from the Elysee. Such was a miserable habitation in which the emperor was pent up a noble specimen of British magnificence and sumptuousness. 27th, the emperor has had a restless night. He had been reading for several hours and was still reading when I saw him at 10 o'clock in the morning. He complained of vague pains in the abdomen. I advised his majesty to cease reading and to take a bath and a little exercise. The dampness of the two rooms was excessive. It attacked and destroyed everything. The paltry nankeen, which served as tapestry, was hanging in rags against the walls. We took it down and endeavored to place before the emperor's eyes something more pleasing by putting up in its stead some muslin we had purchased and which we adorned with some fine birds of Egypt of which we had a collection painted on paper. We grouped our paintings and placed in the midst of them an eagle, which was to protect and guide them. Napoleon smiled on seeing that symbol of victory. Dear eagle, said he, it would still soar on high if those whom it covered with its wings had not arrested its flight. When I returned into my apartment, I found an invitation from the governor. He had heard of the anatomical flights I had brought with me and wished to see them. I showed them to him. He looked at them, examined them, turned from one to the other and back again. And I thought I observed in the eagerness with which he opened them a kind of preoccupation of mine which alarmed me, but I was wrong. His excellency had become suddenly enamored of physiology, and that was all. He harbored no evil thought. At least he did not manifest it outwardly. On the contrary, I heard nothing but encomiums upon the beauty of the work, and nothing else was talked of. The 28th, the emperor little better. I ordered a bath and exercise as I had done the day before. Whilst you were in bed, doctor, said he, I was following your prescription. I had risen at daybreak and was walking out to take a little fresh air, and I am now turning over some ideas which have occurred to me respecting an operation in which my orders were not well executed. The flannel bag was on the ground and Napoleon on his legs, so that I had an opportunity of admiring his costume. It consisted of a white dressing gown, a pair of very wide white trousers with feet, red slippers, a madras shawl round his head, no cravat, and the shirt collar open. I examined this singular dress. The emperor perceived it and said, laughing, ah, I see you would arrest your attention and to punish you for your want of respect for my dress. I close my door against your trucks until tomorrow. I had some algebraical calculations to make. 29th, the emperor very much dejected and complained to repeat his own expression of a deep pain in the liver. He continues to read 
consents but with reluctance to use exercise and takes a bath the carpet of his room was strewed with books there were some around the bed some in the middle of the apartment some close to the walls i cannot understand why they were thus scattered about and asked the cause of this confusion the emperor has read all night well when he wishes to read he covers his bed with books takes them up turns them over and throws them away when he is done with them but why not pick them up because he was still reading did that prevent its being done? As long as the emperor holds a book in his hands, he will not suffer anybody to interrupt him. Good works are allowed to slide down on the floor, and different ones are disdainfully pushed aside, and bad ones thrown against the wall. But it is only when the emperor is out of the room or in his bath that it is allowed to touch them. The 30th, the ever somewhat better. I recommend the use of mercury both internally and externally, but he refuses it and takes a bath. 1st and 2nd October, the emperor in the same state. I again proposed mercurial preparations and recommended exercise. 3rd, the emperor found himself better and agreed to take a little exercise. I accompanied him into the garden and was speaking to him of the care his health required and of the approaching cessation of his sufferings. I believe you, doctor, said he. The climate has been well chosen. It will not let its victim escape. But you, how do you find yourself in your situation? Are the 9,000 francs assigned to you sufficient to satisfy your wants? I assured him that I was too happy in being near his person, that I did not seek fortune, and that my only ambition had been to offer my service to him. That is very well, dear doctor, but to unite both things is still better i give you what i gave at paris circumstances are no longer the same there is no comparison but for that very reason i wish you temporary salary to be equivalent to your wants such is my intention see whether too low an estimate has not been made i replied that i had more than i wanted and that his kindness quite overpowered me how long do you intend to remain here as long as my services are agreeable to your majesty do you know that my surgeon is also the surgeon of the persons forming my establishment? That being alone, he must be at the same time surgeon, physician, and apothecary. I know it, sire. I am devoted to you forever. Dispose of me as you may think fit. Well, I will not detain you more than five years in this rock, and after that time I will settle upon you a pension of eight or nine thousand francs per annum. You will then return to Europe, having enough to lead an independent life. You will be able to resume your anatomical labors and will in time be ranked among the first physiologists of the age. You are entitled to my gratitude, esteem, and affection for the sacrifices you have made for me, and you will justify those sentiments by taking care of me. The emperor continued to converse a long time upon the same subject, and in a few days after, General Monsalon, by his order, repeated to me what he had said. Fourth, the emperor's health in the same state. I advised warm, sulfurous baths, and after his usual bath, he walked in the garden. I followed him. He was gloomy and low-spirited, having seated himself under a tuft of trees, which commanded an extensive view. Ah, doctor, said he, where is the fine climate of Corsica? He paused a few minutes and then continued, Fate has not permitted me to see once more those sights endeared to me by all the recollections of my infant days. I intended to reserve to myself the sovereignty of that island, and I could have done so, but an intrigue. A moment of ill humor altered my choice, and I preferred Elba, and I followed my first idea and retired to Iaccio. Perhaps I should not have thought of seizing again the reins of power. I should not have been vulnerable on every point. The promises made would not have broken, and I should not be here. I had some ideas seeking refuge there in 1815. I was certain of uniting the opinions, wishes, and efforts of all, and I should have found myself in a condition to brave the malevolence of the Allied powers. You know the inhabitants of our mountains. You know their energy, their perseverance, their courage. And with what a noble and undaunted mind they face the enemy. Islands, besides, have their peculiar means of defense. Winds, distance, 
and the difficulties of landing weaken the chances in favor of an aggression against them, and they avoid three-fourths of the evils with which continents are afflicted. The whole population would have received me with open arms. It would have become my family, and all its hearts would have been at my disposal. Do you think that a coalition of 30, 40, or even 50,000 men would have been capable of subduing us? And that they would have dared to attempt it? What sovereign would have engaged in a conflict in the issue of which there was everything to lose and nothing to gain? For I repeat it, the people were devoted to me. From my earliest days, I have had a name and influence in Corsica. It's steep mountains, it's deep valleys, it's torrents, precipices. Offered no dangers to me. I have visited them all from one extremity of the island to the other, and never has a single accident or the slightest insult taught me that my confidence was misplaced, even at Pocognano, where sentiments of hatred and vengeance are transmitted down to the seventh generation. Where in fixing the marriage portion of a young girl, the number of her cousins is taken into account. I was greeted and welcomed, and every sacrifice would have been made for me. It was not, therefore, the sentiments of the population that gave me the least uneasiness, for I knew that every arm was devoted to me, but it would have been said that I got out of the way, that I sought the port whilst I was perishing, and I would not seek for a refuge amidst the wreck of so many brave men. I resolved, therefore, to retire to America and bent my steps towards England, but I was far from foreseeing on what horrible terms she grants her hospitality. I was also deterred by another consideration. Once in Corsica, I did not fear the issue of the struggle, but I should have been in the center of the Mediterranean. The eyes of France and Italy would have been turned towards me, and the effervescence would not have subsided. In order to ensure their own tranquility, the sovereigns would have been obliged to attack me and the island would have been torn by war and I could not bear the idea of being reproached as the cause of its misfortune. Besides, I had abdicated favor my son and such an act could not be illusory. I wished to render it more certain and more advantageous for the nation and feared to paralyze its efforts. Ah, doctor, what recollections Corsica has left me. I still enjoy an imagination its sights and its mountains. Methinks I still tread its soil and know it even by the odor it exhales. I intended to ameliorate its condition, to render it happy in a word, to do everything in its favor, and the rest of France would not have disapproved my predilection. But our disasters came, and I could not carry into effect the plans I had formed. Though mountainous, Corsica is deficient in water and has no large rivers. That was an obstacle to contend with, but the excellence of the soil and local dispositions would have made amends for this defect. The salt pits near Iachi are favorable for a growth of coffee and sugar canes. This has been proved by experiments, and I propose to turn this circumstance to account. I intended to encourage industry, commerce, agriculture, sciences, and arts to give faculties to the inhabitants, to invite families of foreigners into the island, to increase its population, in a word, to put it in a condition to suffice to itself and render itself independent of the continental markets. I had adopted a plan of fortifications upon which I had long meditated and which would have been inexpugnable. St. Florent is one of the most favorable situations I know and the most advantageous for trade. It is close to France and borders upon Italy and its harbors are safe and convenient and capable of receiving large fleets. I should have built there a large and fine city, which would have been the capital. I should have appointed it a fortress, and it would have had ships constantly stationed there. Such were my ideas. Such were the plans I had formed. But my enemies have had the art of making me waste my existence on the field of battle. They have transformed into the demon of war, the man who desired only the blessings of peace. The nations have been deceived by the stratagem. All have risen, and I have been overpowered. However, if I have had it not in my power to carry into execution the plans I had formed in favor of Corsica, I have at least the satisfaction of having done something for Ayaccio. Its port is small, but good 
and well-situated.